and respected emeritus chairperson sir, VC sir, pro VC sir, principal sir, uh, distinguished faculty, my seniors, colleagues and dear students. I welcome you all to the second round of postgraduate combined rounds. Now I hand over the mic to Dr. Naveen to carry on the presentation. A very good morning. Uh, continuing with our series of postgraduate combined rounds, uh, we will be hold, uh, hosting today the second uh, postgraduate combined rounds. The topics uh, in the PGCR are basically decided uh, with with, uh, uh, with keeping in mind that it should be of broad interest to all specialities or residents and it should be useful in day-to-day -day clinical management. So the topic this time we have chosen is anemia and uh, we have a wide range of speakers from various departments. So, Dr. Ashish Pariwal from the Department of Community Medicine will discuss the epidemiology and public health implications. Dr. Vini Chaudhary from Medicine Department will discuss the clinical features. Dr. Rohesh Chauhan from the Department of Pediatrics shall be discussing various aspects which related to children. Dr. Simran from Department of Pathology will discuss uh, uh, the basics of investigations. Dr. Divya Shah from the Department of Ops and Gynae will discuss uh, the relevance of anemia in pregnancy. Dr. Kunal Roy from the Department of Anesthesiology will discuss the importance of anemia in the perioperative and anesthesia setting. And uh, to summarize and to give an approach of uh, the whole uh, workup and management, Dr. Desha Satya, SR from the Department of Clinical Anthropology. So uh, the, the event has been uh, envisaged as an uh, event for the PGs and by the PGs. So we expect uh, active participation and interaction from all the PGs. To kick off the session, I would like to involve, uh, I would like to call Dr. Ashish Baliwal. Uh, junior resident from the Department of Community Medicine. He will discuss uh, the epidemiology, disease burden, and the various national health programs with the related community. Good morning, everybody. Distinguished eminent chairperson, honorable chairperson, esteemed guests, respected faculty members, uh, and fellow attendees. We gather here today in a shared commitment to address a pressing health issue that affects millions globally. Anyway, today I'll be discussing about the burden of food. Today I will be discussing about the burden of disease of anemia and the national programs being implemented by the Government of India for combating this. Uh, WHO defines uh, anemia as a uh, low blood concentration of hemoglobin. There are various cutoffs for different set of patients. WHO classifies anemia as mild, moderate and severe. Uh, the cutoff ranges are mentioned in the tables below. There are, uh, it is important to discuss about anemia as the public health implications of anemia are apparent. Uh, reduced physical development, impact, uh, adverse impact on pregnancy outcomes, reduced cognitive development and vast economic impact. Uh, the demographic data uh, suggests globally 1.76 billion different cases of anemia in 2019, up from 1.44 billion in 1990. Roughly 1 in 4 people in this room are anemic. Some important causes being uh, dietary anemia, uh, nutritional deficiency, predominantly iron deficiency, thalassemia, and malaria. The demographic data uh, available to us is uh, this has been uh, disability adjusted uh, uh, life years. Uh, India performs as poorly as uh, Sub Saharan Africa. Uh, talking about the Indian context, iron uh, deficiency anemia has been the main cause of uh, health burden in India based on pre uh, previous uh, global health surveys, poverty, caste issues, poor sanitation and principal factors contribute to anemia in India. India is among the worst affected countries ranking 170 out of 180. In the figure we see that Rajasthan comes as the in, in the worst five performing states in terms of children suffering from anemia especially in rural areas. Uh, talking of the Indian context, this is the latest data available to us, which is NHS5, conducted from 2019 to 2021. Uh, as we can see, these are the major demographic, uh, uh, the urban and the rural uh, population. We can clearly see the segregation here, where the rurals are more affected by anemia than in urban. The same thing remains uh, from NHS5 to NHS4, where the prevalence of anemia has gone up irrespective of gender, age. Coming to the Rajasthan context, Rajasthan also follows the same national pattern of the rural areas being more affected by anemia. But as we can see in the figure, uh, uh, this figure, uh, just one second, sorry. As we can see, Rajasthan outdoes uh, uh, the Indian averages in these four regards. 
there are various health programs from the initiative government of India to combat uh, the increase in uh, anemia. Uh, some of it being National Island Plus Initiative, National Nutritional Anemia Control Program, Midday Meal Scheme, <coughs> Integrated Child Development Services, Pradhan Mutte Surakshat Matan Kabiyan, Rashtriya Kishore Swastika Kalyan, Anemia Amak Bharat, which is a flagship program of Indian government, Koshan Abhiyan. Uh, aside from these programs, few programs have been implemented to counter hemoglobin of as well. Uh, this is the latest program which we have, National Program for Prevention and Control of Hemoglobin of uh, This is a pilot project right now, uh, only being impl implemented in 13 districts. Other than this, Rashtriya Pal Swastha Karikram, state uh, blood cells and thalassemia control units. Aside from this, uh, Red Cross has been, uh, yeah, along with the government of India, has been doing uh, really remarkable work, uh, providing uh, counselling uh, to the target groups who are at risk of thalassemia. If I were to concise all of the government programs and under one umbrella, I would just like to say, look east. Whether you are a clinician or an educator, you just have to look east, educate your patient, anticipate, screen, treat your patient. Thank you. I would now like to invite Dr. Reddick from Internal Medicine for the initial presentation of Anitya. Good morning, respected professors, seniors, my dear colleagues and junior. I am Dr. Jini Chaudhary from the Department of General Medicine and I am here to discuss about the clinical signs, symptoms and examination findings in the case of anemia. Prior to this, let's have a brief background. I would, before we dwell further, I would like to first describe, describe about the structure of hemoglobin. The structure of hemoglobin consists of a heme and globin. Heme is the pigment part, whereas the globin is the protein part. Globin contains two alpha and two beta chains. The, pig, the heme part, which is the pigment part, contains a uh, iron, contains a protoporphyrin ring with a central iron in the molecule, uh, with, with a central iron molecule. This iron molecule plays a key role in oxygen binding capacity of hemoglobin contained within the erythrocyte. These erythrocytes originate as pro-erythroblasts. Now, as we move from left to right side of the spectrum, we will see uh, nuclear chromatin condensation, autophagy of the organelles. In this process of moving from pro-erythroblast to a mature erythrocyte, the hemoglobin production greatly increases. Now, moving further, we come across a 30-year-old lady who comes to us with complaints of easy fatigability, lassitude, dizziness, dyspnea, and headache. Can we suspect anemia? Let's brainstorm key points in history that illustrate the importance of meticulous history in a case of anemia. I would now like to ask the audience what important points in history can be asked in a case of anemia? transfusion in the past, any history of bleeding. In personal history, we will look for history of alcohol consumption. Uh, occupation history, we will look for uh, occupational exposure to, uh, our, to, chemicals, to chemical solvents, benzene. Travel history is important as uh, travel to endemic uh, infect areas suggest infectious etiologies like tuberculosis or malaria. Dietary history, as rightly said, is uh, have to be looked upon for vitamin B12 deficiency in a true vegan. Also, people consuming less nutritious diets are also predisposed to various kinds of anemia. Any underlying medical conditions such as a malignancy or inflammatory conditions also predisposed to various anemia. Uh, treatment history of bone marrow suppressing drugs are also very important. Now, talking about the general physical examination findings, with a whiz, uh, bounding pulse with tachycardia can be seen in long-standing anemia. Low volume pulse with tachycardia is a feature of acute blood loss. 
As we can see, uh, we can also look for pallor in the lower part of the hinging tiber of the eye. We can also compare the readiness in the hands of a normal individual to the pallor in the anemic individual. Besides, we can also see icterus. Skin hyperpigmentation can also be seen in vitamin B12 deficiency. Oral ulcers can be a feature of folate deficiency. We can also have dry or rough skin, atrophic glossitis and angular colitis. Colonachia is a classical feature of iron deficiency anemia. In severe cases of anemia, alopecia can also be seen. We can also rule out the other cytopenias, like the second image showing thrombocytopenia purpura. We can also look for other lineages involvement in this case. So how about systemic examination findings? Are there any key points that we should be vigilant about? Yes, in cardiovascular system, we can find tachycardia, hyperdynamic apex speed, capillary pulsations, a murmur, cardiomegaly, and later we develop signs of heart failure. In nervous system, we can have polyneuropathies, and in gastrointestinal system, we can have uh, hepatosplenomegaly. To summarize my talk before you, let's see together the basic pathophysiology, symptoms, clinical history, general and system examination findings to inculcate the diagnosis of anemia. Now, basic classification of anemia on the basis of cause could be broadly classified into three headings. Uh, Hyperproliferative anemias, which contains uh, nutritional anemia, bone marrow disorders and chronic diseases. Hemorrhagic anemia, which include acute and chronic blood losses. Uh, hemolytic anemia would include acquired and inherited causes of hemolytic anemia as well as immune mediated anemias. I would now like to call upon Dr. Uvesh Chauhan to enlighten us on the periodic aspect of anemia. Thank you. Good morning everyone. Now I will discuss in the clinical aspects of uh, anemia in pediatric age group. Definition of anemia is termed when hemoglobin level is below two standard deviation for uh, below two standard deviation for mean for particular age and sex being evaluated. As per WHO, anemia is termed uh, in six months to 60 months of age when hemoglobin level is below 110 gram per deciliter. Between five to 11 years of age when hemoglobin level is 114 gram per liter below 114 gram per liter and between 12 to 14 years of age below 119 gram per liter. Now what are the important age related information on history and evaluation of anemia? In infants, antenatal history suggesting of maternal anemia, blood loss, infections, history of multiple pregnancies can lead to anemia in neonates. Birth history suggesting of prematurity is commonly associated with iron deficiency anemia, early cord clamping, perinatal blood loss, multiple episodes of phlebotomy during an ICU state, neonatal zonies and cephalohematoma can lead to anemia. <coughs> Nutritional history suggestive of exclusive breastfeeding even after 6 months of age. Intake of cow milk or cow formula milk can be associated with iron deficiency anemia. Goat milk is, uh, intake of goat milk is associated with folate deficiency and poor intake of vitamins and hematinics can be seen in, uh, can be associated with nutritional anemia. In young age, timing and nutritional quality of winning foods and history of pica is seen in nutritional anemias. History of the worms such as encyclostoma duodenal is associated with iron deficiency. Epistaxis and hematuria can also lead to anemias. Uh, anemic patients usually come with delay in milestone and retardation in physical growth. Family history suggestive of consanguinity, history of splenectomy, history of anemia or blood transfusion can give clue to the inherited hemolytic anemias. History of recurrent jaundice and blood transfusion can be seen in hemolytic anemias. Now what are the presenting complaints of anemia in pediatrics? Parents will bring the child with complaint that their child is not accepting feed properly or has a restless behavior, irritability, inadequate scholastic performance, low physical performance, breath holding spells, growth retardation, hyperpigmentation of knuckles, num numbness in fingers and failure to thrive. Hemolytic anemia, uh, now what is pica? Pica is an eating disorder characterized by eating non-eatable items usually seen uh, in children more than <coughs> 2 years of age and associated with malnutrition. Uh, features suggestive of hemolytic anemia as hemolytic, inherited hemolytic anemia are uh, specific to pediatric age group. Pallor is present, ictrus and hemolytic phases or thalassemic phases as you can see in picture that is frontal bulging, depression of nasal bridge, prominent zygomatic bonds, dental malocclusions. Uh, leg ulcers can be seen in sickle cell anemia and USD suggestive of gallstone can give clue to the hemolytic anemias. Now I will discussing the thalassemia which is the most common genetic disorder 
in world. Thalassemia is a hemoglobin patch that occurs due to mutation in globin gene, and among which beta thalassemia is more common. Beta thalassemia is an absence or deficiency of beta chain synthesis of adult hemoglobin. Uh, it has three main components beta thalassemia major, intermediate, and minor. Beta thalassemia major is inherited in autosomal recessive manner. It is happen when uh, mutation on both of their allele is present. It is made, characterized by transition dependent and, uh, thalassemia and signs and symptoms occur usually within first two years of life. In HB electrophoresis, uh, fetal hemoglobin is nearly 80% and adult hemoglobin is very low. Thalassemia intermedia is less severe than major and is also called as non-transition dependent thalassemia. Uh, in this patient, experience anemia and HB electrophoresis suggestive of uh, fetal hemoglobin nearly 40 to 60 percent. Beta thalassemia trait or minor uh, occurs when single mutation on only one of their allele is present, and prevalence rate is uh, in Indian community communities around 3 to 17 percent in different uh, Indian communities. Uh, thalassemia trait are usually carriers and often asymptomatic or have mild anemia. In HB electrophoresis, HB A2 level is more than 3.5 gram per cent. 3.5 percent. Uh, now, when both the parents are carrier, there are 25 percent of chance, uh, chances that child has a disease. 25 percent of chances that child is a normal, and 50 percent of chances that child can be a carrier. Now, what are the management of beta thalassemia? Management of beta thalassemia measure is regular blood transfusion, iron chelation, dietary advice, and genetic counseling. Can anyone tell what dietary advice should we give to beta thalassemic major patient? Uh, we will uh, advise patient to take uh, uh, iron, low iron content food such as jaggery, pomegranate and red meat and advise them to take a tea with meals to decrease absorption of iron from meals. And treatment is bone marrow transplant and gene therapy and gene editing in near future. In our hospital, total 44 bone marrow transplant has have been done in uh, since August 2021 in pediatric. <coughs> now I would like to request Dr. Simran to discuss pathological aspect of anemia. In our central lab, we receive more than 700 samples of CBC in a day, and approximately more than one third of those samples are anemic. So CBC is a very basic yet very important investigation when it comes to anemia. Good morning everyone, I'm Dr. Simran from Department of Pathology and I'll be discussing about the ABC of CBC, PBF and reticulocyte count. Now before we start, Dr. Deni had already explained about the basic steps of erythropoiesis. So just to brush up, is there uh, anyone who remembers the steps of erythropoiesis? Uh, more right through blast, basophilic right through blast, polychromatic right through blast, uh, orthochromatic right through blast, Yes, so that is correct. Uh, erythropoiesis occurs in bone marrow. So all the steps until reticulocyte count occurs till until the reticulocyte formation occurs till bone marrow. For uh, for the PBF, reticulocytes are very important because they spend three days on the marrow and then one to two days in the peripheral blood. <coughs> So, uh, if you see uh, up to 2.5 to 2.5% reticulocytes in the blood, it is completely normal. They are completely normal. Um, so, uh, and also from reticulocyte to erythrocyte, when the maturation occurs, the cell size decreases. So, reticulocytes are more in size than the erythrocytes. Uh, now, coming to the complete blood counts. Uh, we'll talk about the when the sample is received, it goes into an automated hematology analyzer. The basic principle of the automated hematology analyzers that we have in our lab is that this is the external electrode, this is an internal electrode. In between, there is an aperture through which each and every cell passes. So, when one cell passes, it uh, gives a voltage peak. And that is how all the values are generated. Now, this is the report that comes from the hematology analyzers. When it comes to CBC, we will just stick to the RBC value, hemoglobin, hematocrit, all the indices, and RDW, that is red cell distribution width. Uh, to know what these indices are, so mu corpuscular vo uh, volume, or MCV, is the volume of an RBC. It is defined as the hematocrit upon RBC. It is uh, given in femtoliters. Mean corpuscular hemoglobin, or MCH, is the hemoglobin that each RBC contains. So it is hemoglobin in gram per liter divided by RBC. And mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration, or MCHC, is the, is the volume of hemoglobin per unit hematocrit. 
the normal values of MCV. These are the standardized values. So the normal value of MCV for a healthy adult male is 92 plus minus 9. But for practical purposes, we consider it as 80 to 100. For MCH, it is 29.5 plus minus 2.5. And MCHC, it is 33 plus minus 1.5. So the units are split The femtoliter and... Sir. So, so when we calculate, uh, so RBC as a standardized is given per liter. Uh, so when the MCV is uh, the Excel distribution width is the degree of uh, change in size of the RBC. So for standard, uh, uh, Excel distribution width for standard as a coefficient of variation it is 12.8 plus minus 1.2. If it is small, then that it contain it uh, suggests an isocytosis. Okay. Uh, so there are two uh, ways the analyzer gives a distribution with. One is the standard of deviation, and one is the coefficient of variance. But coefficient of variance is considered better as the standard of deviation. So the analyzer uh, uh, it would suggest an isocytosis. Sir. Yes, sir. because there is change in size of the RBC. Can you give a example? Yes, sir. yes, sir. So uh, we will come back to uh, sorry, we will come back to this CBC report. So in this report, uh, in general, RBC to hemoglobin to hematocrit, they are all in uh, up into three into three. Uh, uh, that is how we see. So RBC into 3 uh, for a normocytic normochromic individual is gives a hemoglobin value and into 3 of that is gives the hematocrit value. In this we can see that the MCV is uh, normal. MCH is normal and MCHC is slightly reduced. But uh, so by looking at these we would think that it is a normocytic normochromic anemia but we can see that the RDW is more in this. So th that would suggest an isocytosis and that would... Uh, it will increase, sir. It depends on the individual. Uh, it might be towards the microcytic or towards the normocytic side, but RDW will increase. So, uh, moving forward. Uh, so that is why in these cases, uh, looking at a peripheral blood film is very important to know if uh, it is actually a dimorphic anemia or what kind of an anemia it is. To no, increase, yes. Uh, for making a peripheral blood film, we put a drop of blood on the slide, we spread it, and then we use a Leishman stain in our lab, which uh, and. Uh, uh, Leishman stain, you can uh, do it manually or in a lab we have uh, an, uh, a stainer, an automated stainer which gives a more uh, uniform stain. <coughs> uh, along with the peripheral blood film, reticulocyte counts are again very important. Uh, this, uh, so reticulocytes are uh, the premature RBC, reticulocytes are premature RBCs which uh, contain the cytoplasmic RRNA. Uh, so when you put a supravital stain like pneumothylene glue that we use in our lab, it gives a color to those RNAs. Uh, so above is how a reticulocyte looks like. Now it can be, be counted per thousand cells, so this can be a normal picture. Uh, but uh, below picture, it shows increased in reticulocytes as well as uh, the reticulocytes are in more condensed form. So that would, uh, it might be a picture of hemolytic by just looking at it, if there's increased reticulocyte count. I will uh, come to hemolytic anemia. <laughs> um, so this, sir. Uh, so reticulocyte count, uh, we count it. Uh, so we take a field which approximately has 100 RBCs and we count it per 1000 RBCs and then we make it a percentage. Corrected reticulocyte count, uh, the importance is that uh, suppose a person has a hematocrit of, uh, uh, let's say, 40% and... Uh, PCV, sir, Paxil and How much is the Paxil volume? Uh, what is the hematocrit that is Paxil volume? Yes, sir. So we sent, uh, manually, we used to do it by centrifugation, but uh, now the... Uh, 
Yes, by centrifugation. By centrifugation. upon the average PCV for that age. Uh, connected is very important because uh, anemia is based on the hemoglobin. Suppose uh, one person has a hematocrit of 40% and the other has a hematocrit of 20% and both are giving a reticulocyte count as 0.9. Then uh, there is a difference because 0.9, uh, if you correct it, it will come up to 0.2 or something. So it is reduced, it is not normal then for that uh, hematocrit. Uh, in cases especially, uh, uh, we discussed that uh, in uh, normally uh, reticulocytes are in peripheral blood for one to two days, but uh, suppose in hemolytic anemia or in any where, where there's overproduction in the marrow, the reticulocytes are released in the peripheral blood early, so they are for more time in the peripheral blood. Uh, in those cases, a reticulocyte production index is very important, which is corrected reticulocyte count upon maturation time and days. And the maturation time and days is based on the PCV value. Uh, now we will come to the interpretation of common cases. So this, uh, let's see the CBC first. Uh, we can see that there is decrease in hemoglobin level. This, uh, Decrease in MCV, so that would suggest a microcytic anemia. There's decrease in MCH and MCHC as well, and then there's increase in red cell distribution width. So this is a case of microcytic hypochromic anemia. Uh, this is the peripheral blood film of this case. It was a 40-year-old female. In this PDF, we can see that there are pencil cells. Uh, there are tear drop cells and this is, uh, by the way, a small lymphocyte nucleus. So if you compare the red cells adjacent to this nucleus, you can see that they are microcytic. Uh, this is a tear drop cells and these are elliptocytes. This is a classic picture of uh, an iron deficiency anemia. Now, uh, <clears throat> uh, comparing it to the picture below, uh, we can see that in this picture, there are a few fragmented RBCs and there is a target cell. Uh, in the target cell happens, so this is a classic picture of thalassemia. The target cell happens because uh, the red cell membrane is too much as compared to the red cell volume. So that is why the target cell is there. Also, 
if uh, you see a, if you see a CPC and if you want to screen the patient whether he has iron deficiency or thalassemia, an important indicator is menses index, that is MCV upon RBC. So if the menses index is more than 13, it would suggest iron deficiency, and if it is less than 13, it would suggest thalassemia. Um, now uh, let's look at this CPC. Uh, the hemoglobin is low, it is very severe anemia. MCV is more than 100, uh, MCH, MCHC. Uh, RDW is again raised at 16.7. This is the peripheral blood film. We can see polychromatophils. So polychromatophils are uh, what we see as reticulocytes and supravital stains. In peripheral blood film, they are seen as uh, cells with slight bluish tinge due to the cytoplasmic RNA and they are called polychromatophils. These are the teardrop cells and these are macroovalocytes. This is again a small uh, lymphocyte and if you compare, they are macrocytic and they are macroovalocytes. Plus, there are hypersegmented neutrophils, so this is a classic case of uh, megaloblastic anemia. Now, if you compare these two to this uh, PBF, you can see that they are the RBC size is more than that of the small lymphocyte nucleus, so they are macrocytes, but they are not macroovalocytes, they are still round in shape, and there are a few teardrop cells. Uh, it becomes a very important differential because in cases of liver disease, uh, you don't see macroovalocytes, you see macrocytes which are round in shape and you see target cells. So you can suspect a liver disease in this patient. Uh, coming to hemolytic anemia, now if you see uh, in this uh, uh, CBC, the RBC is 1 but the hemoglobin is 4. So the 1 is to 3 ratio is uh, distorted. Uh, that is because uh, the analyzer, since the RBCs are clumped together, so if you see this is the peripheral blood film picture of this patient. So the RBCs are clumped together and the analyzer thinks it as one single large RBC. So that is why the RBC count is low but the hemoglobin is comparatively more than that. RBW is again increased, MCV is increased because the clumped RBCs are thought as a single RBC which are larger in size. Uh, so you see clumped RBCs, you see a lot of polychromatophils in this picture. If you if you would have done a, a reticulocyte count, it would have been increased in this. So this is a case of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. If you compare this to below the picture, uh, you can see spherocytes in this. These are all round spherocytes. So this is a, this was a case of hereditary spherocytosis. And again, a very important differential. Uh, this was a small child, uh, we saw uh, sickle cells in this, so these are the sickle cells, these are the classic sickle cells, but these are also bow shaped sickle cells, so these are plump sickle cells, but you see both the ends are tapered, and this is a nucleated RBC, is what we write as NRBCs, and this is again a polychromatophil. Now coming to uh, reticulocyte count, so in microcytic anemia, we, as we discussed earlier of this, uh, increased reticulocyte count, that would suggest thalassemia. In macrocytic and normocytic anemia, it would suggest an overproduction of marrow, that is leading and hemolysis. Uh, again, a very important thing in this is, in, even in cases of nutritional anemia on treatment, so suppose there's iron deficiency or megaloblastic anemia, but they are on treatment, so the uh, bone marrow will start producing more cells because they, they, the patient is getting better. You will find an increased reticulocyte count in that. So it is very important that even in emergencies, before uh, transfusing blood to the patient or before starting with any treatment, you please send a sample of CBC uh, and PBF and reticulocyte count so that a proper diagnosis can be made. Now I would uh, like to call upon Dr. Divya Shah. Uh, from the Department of Ops and Gynae to discuss a very special scenario in anemia, that is anemia in pregnancy. Thank you, Dr. Simplin. Good morning, teachers. I would like to take this discussion forward on anemia in pregnancy. Why is anemia in pregnancy different than general population or general anemia? The incidences, prevalences and the basic clinical features have been rightly discussed by my colleagues. Talking about incidences of in, uh, anemia in India, urban and rural populations 
uh, incidences of anemia in Rajasthan is for close to 46%, but uh, incidences of anemia in pregnant women in, Raj, uh, in Mahatma Gandhi was conducted based on a study by, doc, by my senior Dr. Nena. It was based on the women who entered the antenatal clinic and they were studied for throughout the pregnancy out of which uh, the incidence was 63%, mildly anemic were 11%, moderately anemic were 48.2% and severely anemic were 4.5%. And uh, discussing why anemia in pregnancy is different than the general population, uh, it is because of the physiological changes that happens. The blood volume and the plasma volume increases by 45 to 50%, wherein the red cell mass increases by 20 to 30%. So the liquid component has increased more than the solid component, which results in relative hemodilution in pregnancy. WHO and ICMR has categorized anemia in pregnancy. Talking about the WHO categories, mild anemia is 10 to 10.9 gram per deciliter, moderate anemia is 7 to 9.9 and severely anemics are se less than 7 gram per deciliter. Comparing it with the ICMR categories, mild anemia is 10 to 11, moderate anemia is 7 to 10, severe anemia is 4 to 7 and very severe anemia is less than 4 gram per deciliter. The pathological causes of anemia in pregnancy, most common being the nutritional deficiencies out of which iron deficiency anemia is 80%, folic acid deficiency, vitamin B12 deficiency, other causes being hemorrhagic, anemia of chronic diseases and hereditary causes. The anemia in pregnancy affects not only the mother as well as the fetus. Talking about the effects of anemia on mother, in the antenatal period, there are chances of preterm labor, pre-labor rupture of membranes, infections, cardiac failure and antepartum hemorrhage. The intrapartum causes being maternal exhaustion, uterine inertia and cardiac failure most common in the third stage of labor. In the postnatal period, postpartum hemorrhage, subinvolution, sepsis, cardiac failure, postpartum depression and poor wound healing is found. So effects of anemia on fetus. As we see, the mother is always a giver. So the fetus is less likely affected and rarely has iron deficiency anemia because of the placentomegaly and the good supply from the, fe uh, from the mother to the fetus. The causes, but the basic effects of anemia on fetus being fetal growth restriction, which is most common because the, if the goes, if the child goes in preterm labor, intrauterine death, or increased perinatal mortality because of preterm labor. Lab diagnosis: the Indian guidelines suggest antenatal women uh, four visits in the antenatal period and four hemo CBC checkups during the same. Complete hemogram, hemogram is advised for typing of anemia. Talking about the management, Anemia Mukt Bharat and uh, Integrated National Ambulance Initiative is uh, followed. During pl while planning a pregnancy, folic acid 400 microgram should be given for neural tube defect prevention. Whereas if the patient comes to us in the antenatal period, in the first trimester, 400 microgram folic acid per day is advised. And after first trimester, iron and folic acid tablets, tablets are advised for 180 days antepartum and 180 days postpartum to replenish the iron stores. Management of iron deficiency in pregnancy. In case of mild anemia, oral tablets are advised. But in case of moderate anemia, if the patient, uh, if the mother is less than 30 weeks, oral iron tablets are advised. That is two tabs per day. And the hemoglobin is checked after three weeks or one month. And the Based on that report, if the patient is non-compliant, intolerant, faulty absorption or are there are un any undiagnosed blood losses, parenteral iron is advised. But in case of severe anemia, that is hemoglobin less than 5 gram per uh, deciliter at any gestational age, blood transfusion is advised. But if the hemoglobin is between 5 to 6.9, we have two choices. If the patient is at 30 to 36 weeks of gestation, parenteral iron is advised, contraindications being first trimester, hemochromatosis and thalassemia major. But if the patient is more than 36 weeks of gestational age, blood transfusion is advised. Talking about thalassemia in pregnancy, if the mother is thalassemia minor or major, we have to check for the partner status. 
if the report suggests that both are carrier, there is compulsory preconceptional genetic counselling advised. And if the if the mother comes to us in the antenatal period uh, or in the first trimester at around 11th week, chorionic fillus sampling is advised. In case of second trimester, cordocentesis or amniocentesis is advised. And in um, the later stage, DNA analysis is done. And if the pa uh, fetus is thalassemia major, we we advise the patient to terminate the pregnancy. Thank you. Uh, Olivia, as discussed up till now, has certain considerations significance and management of plan pre-operatively, intraoperatively, uh, the patient has, uh, the patient especially in this year, has no uh, self-control over what happens to their human animals. And in these scenarios, the anesthetist plays a vital role. <coughs> How much of hemoglobin is okay to induce a patient? And why is the anesthetist always the devil in the scrubs? Uh, as for CPOC guidelines, Centre for Perioperative Care and uh, update, updated in November of 2022, the minimum hemoglobin required for non-cardiac surgery is 10 grams per deciliter and for cardiac surgery is 12 grams per deciliter given the higher weight loss, uh, the higher blood loss and the worse cardiac outcomes associated with the cardiac surgery. Why are we stuck on these values? Why is the surgeon wanting to take a case? Why is the anesthetist resisting surgery? There is only one source of oxygen transport in the body, that is the hemoglobin, that is the heme, paired with the uh, uh, O2 molecules, HB4O8 carries 98% of the body's total oxygen, only 2% is dissolved in the plasma. <laughs> this hemoglobin is exactly what we are using in an anemic patient. Also, surgery is an invasive treatment method, we are going to lose more of hemoglobin as time proceeds during the surgery. 1 gram of uh, hemoglobin carries 1.34 to 39 ml of oxygen per uh, minute cost called the Huffner's constant. Now, there is only one modality to carry oxygen. We are going to lose it in the OT. And if the patient loses a lot of blood, they are said to lose their cool and calm. As we see, hemoglobin is paired with oxygen. At a particular uh, pressure of oxygen, there is a particular saturation of oxygen known as the P50 value, commonly being 28 to 30 millimeters of mercury for oxygen. Uh, this is vital only in the physiological state where the patient is not anemic, not lost a lot of blood, and has ideal temperature and pH. If the patient is losing blood, the heme goes in a state of oxygen unloading, known as the right shift of the ODC or the oxygen delivery state. This causes a reduced uptake of oxygen by the heme, eventually leading to a hypoxemic state and worsening is only done by intraoperative blood loss. <coughs> the most important thing in, in this scenario is a patient may land up to a cardiac event even three months after the operative procedure if they've lost a lot of blood in the OT or if they were not optimized preoperatively. It's also seen that respiratory uh, Patients present with a longer ventilatory requirement, more post-operative pneumonia, higher risk of a stroke, and maternal shock and fetal hypoxia. It can easily be prevented by a simple CVC preoperatively and optimization through vital method. The surgery itself may cause anemia. A patient that came to the OT with a hemogram of 12 may leave with a hemogram of 4 or even less. It has happened. We can prevent it by very very uh, simple modalities done at the right time. A modality done in time deals a lot more health than a transfusion post-operatively. We have to minimize the blood loss, create as a meticulous uh, blood-free field as possible. For example, a tourniquet placement in an orthopedic surgery using a laparoscopic technique in place of an open technique. Uh, we have to maintain blood volume at all times. We replace the lost blood with an equal amount of crystalloids. One is to one replacement is what's the latest guideline. If the, the anesthetist is very comfortable at a intraoperative hemoglobin state, 80 grams per deciliter. Uh, there is a technique known as a cell saver. This uses the blood that's lost in the operating room. It's run through a device that has a uh, filter that reduces all the cells out of the blood that is lost, leaving only the red blood cells. This is known as a uh, WBC filter. The WBC filter removes the karyocytes and the WBC 
rendering the fluid only with RBC. This can be salvaged intraoperatively over a duration of 1 to 2 hours and the blood can be transfused there and then. It is assumed to be sterile since the collection method is sterile. The other method is acute normovolumic hemodilution. What we are trying to do here is we uh, lobotomize the patient for about uh, 1 to 2 points. We supplement the same volume with IV fluids. Now what happens is if I assume the if I assume the compartment to be a one by one centimeter box, the number of <coughs> RBCs present in that box are reduced because I have pre-operatively withdrawn some blood. At this point, if there is a loss in the operating room, the in one ml or if I for ease of simplification, I make it into a box, the number of RBCs lost in that one ml reduced significantly. Or to simplify it, I will reduce the hematocrit of the patient so that total number of RBCs lost is lesser. This, the blood that we have salvaged preoperatively, can be replaced postoperatively once the procedure is done. Anemia can not only affect uh, my side of the story, it can also cause a better outcome for a surgeon. It can increase morbidity, post op infections, ICU stay, hospital acquired disease and an overall risk of morbidity is significantly increased in an anemic patient, majorly cardiac events. What the evidence shows at present is, if we are restricting a hemoglobin trigger from 8 to 7, in that case, overall patients exposed to a foreign RBC reduces by 43%, which reduces all the complications associated with the transfusion. Restricted transfusion, however, does not decrease mortality by any means or it is in a 30 day period. Thank you. Good morning everyone. I would like to give you a brief breakdown of uh, clinical approach and treatment of anemia. Um, I will discuss on how to take everything that we have already learnt and incorporate into an overall approach to diagnosis. More than 95% of the diagnosis can be made. Uh, with a proper history examination and the first set of uh, investigations that we order for almost all references that we receive. The CBC, PPF, reticulocyte count and LDH. Features of nutritional deficiency, presence of other cytopenias and low uh, to normal reticulocyte count with a normal LDH would suggest a probable underproduction of RBCs. While um, an ictric patient with venomegaly elevated reticulocyte count and LDH and other uh, hemolysis labs like increased indirect bilirubin and decreased haptoglobin will indicate probable hemolysis. <coughs> Normocytic anemia can be present in early stages of anemia of chronic disease, dimorphic anemia, early stages of iron deficiency anemia, anemia of chronic disease, and if pancytopenia or blasts and smear are present along with macrocytic anemia, uh, normocytic anemia, we evaluate with uh, bone marrow aspiration and biopsy, can be seen in acute leukemia, myeloma, lymphoproliferative neoplasms, uh, and aplastic anemia with myeloplastic disorders. Hemolysis, the reticulocyte count, LDH, and uh, indirect <coughs> bilirubin will be increased along with uh, ictris, phenomegaly, hemolytic facies, and would be present on examination. Uh, Hemolysis can be long-standing, <coughs> acute or episodic. Long-standing uh, hemolysis, splenomegaly, gallstones, and hemolytic facies would be present uh, with uh, indicated heritage disorders like thalassemia, sickle cell disease, hereditary strep psychosis. And uh, acute and episodic uh, uh, hemolysis can be intravascular or extravascular. Intravascular, uh, the hemoglobin urea is present. It can be in G6PD deficiency, PNH, AI, um, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and extravascular uh, hemolysis is, uh, will present with splenomegaly in case of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. A sick patient in the ICU with renal failure and MODS can. Splenomegaly? Uh, so, due to the uh, extra uh, vascular hemolysis that is happening in the spleen itself. Which part of the spleen is Then you can add the spleen Will indicate thrombotic microangiopathy or DIC. Um, <laughs> As iron deficiency anemia is the most common cause of anemia in India and worldwide, I'll be discussing in brief about the management of the same. 
and uh, it is treated with oral iron therapy, parenteral preparations, and blood transfusion. Dietary absorption is usually 5 to 15 percent in a healthy uh, person, but about 25 to 30 in an iron deficiency patient. It is um, the first line therapy in stable patients with isolated iron deficiency. Iron replacement dose is calculated with Ganzini formula as given. So, um, there are a number of oral formulations available like Periscumulate, Periscumulate. And uh, the recommended therapy for adult is 100 mg uh, elemental iron per day. Uh, the compliance is low because of the GI side effects like nausea, elastic discomfort, vomiting, constipation, metallic taste. Refractiveness is defined as a hemoglobin increment of less than 1 gram per dl after 4 weeks of therapy. But for practical purpose, a lack of increase in hemoglobin by second week or a lack of retinal site increase up after one week of oral iron therapy is defined as refractiveness. It can be due to incorrect diagnosis, continued bleeding, non-compliance with therapy and malabsorption. In, um, the indications of parenteral therapy are refractiveness to oral iron therapy, iron intolerance, erythropoietin stimulating agents in the treatment of CKD, iron deficiency in patients with heart failure. It has been recently approved by FDA uh, June 23. A uh, need for quick hemoglobin recovery and substitute for uh, blood transfusion. Parenteral therapy. Uh, the, uh, this is the list of parenteral preparations. Most common used uh, preparation is iron sucrose and ferric carboxy maltose. Iron sucrose is inexpensive and uh, maximum of 200 mg can be administered in one setting with ferric carboxy uh, maltose is, in, is expensive and we can replace about 750 to 1000 mg of iron in one setting and total replacement can be administered in one or two infusions. Uh, now when to transfuse? For hemodynamically stable patients, a restrictive transfusion strategy is preferred over liberal transfusion strategy, but the final uh, decision to transfuse should incorporate the clinical status, comorbidities, and the plan of treatment. I want to emphasize that there's no single cutoff for transfusing, or rather, final decision to transfuse should incorporate the clinical status and comorbidities. Um, so, symptomatic patient, the cutoff here is 10, while for other patients, it's roughly 7 to 8. Threshold, uh, uh, major exception, uh, exceptions to the use of threshold of 7 to 8 is in symptomatic patients, patients with acute coronary syndrome, chronic transfusion dependent anemias, and um, threshold based transfusion not appropriate for patients requiring tra massive transfusions, trauma, or GI bleeding. Estimated blood loss and hemodynamic status should guide the transfusion. I'm going to stop here now. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Naveen, sir, for concluding remarks. He's also the guiding force behind the series of presentation in Anemia. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nisha. And uh, uh, I hope uh, with this PGCR, uh, we've uh, managed to impart uh, a good uh, basic knowledge to all the PGs. And uh, uh, I hope everyone had a good, uh, enjoyed uh, the good discussion. Uh, for the PGs particularly, I prepared a set of few questions, so uh, if, if I can get quick answers, uh, only PGs allowed here. Uh, the site of secretion of erythropoietin, anyone please raise your hand and answer, please don't answer in groups. Yes? Uh, be more specific, where in the kidney? It is a hormone produced by the liver ultimately inhibits uh, iron absorption in the gut and inhibits release of iron from the macrophages. So, in cases of uh, wherever we have higher abscidin values in cases of uh, chronic diseases like CKD or chronic inflammation, the iron absorption remains low. What is phagophagia? It's related to anemia. Uh, hint it's related to iron deficiency anemia. Uh, another hint, it is related to pica. Yes. So it's a form of pica where the there is an extreme impulse to eat ice. And that's also a feature of iron deficiency in India. An easy one, virus causing pure red cell aplasia. Parvovirus is connected. And uh, to end, iron content of one unit of packed RBC. How many milligrams of iron is there in one unit of packed RBC? One volunteer, please don't prompt. Anyone, please raise your hand and answer, please. Any guesses?
No, iron content. Iron content is 200 to 250 milligrams of iron from one unit of fat diabetes. It's important in patients who are receiving repeated transfusions like thalassemia who eventually develop iron. Uh, to conclude and to summarize uh, all uh, the seven speakers, so we one in, we have one in four people who are anemic. It's a major uh, public health problem. With iron deficiency anemia taking the burden of the blame. <coughs> History and examination will never go out of favor and there are so many features in history and examination that can, even before the first investigation, we can delineate the, the, the type and the subtype of anemia and the etiology as well. Children with anemia have varying presentation from adults and they've got special needs and special uh, diseases, thalassemia being one of them, and it requires uh, a, a, like a completely different set of management. With very basic investigations of CBC, peripheral blood film and reticulocyte count, the type and the subtype of anemia can be identified in the vast majority of patients even without any of the major fancy investigations. So these remain the crux of identifying the type of anemia and the etiology. And uh, it's, it's a condition associated with increased maternal and perinatal morbidity, mortality, long-term adverse effects in the newborn and adverse surgical outcomes. And the use of transfusion should always be judicious and it should not be threshold based, it should be uh, based on the clinical context. So with this I end and uh, uh, I would like to announce the next PGCR would be on the topic of jaundice, uh, the first Friday of November, which is the third, and under the guidance of Dr. Karan Kumar from the Department of Technology. I thank you all for your patient hearing, and uh, regards to the attendance, uh, we can scan this QR code and monitor. Thank you so much.